All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, before we dive into our new topic, uh, a few announcements. I posted these announcements in Canvas as well. Hope you guys get those updates. You've already seen this. And the exam number two is going to be scheduled in class and on Thursday, which is 420. I believe this is the Thursday after our Easter break. And so that will be not the last day of class, but near, near the end of class. And the idea here is to sort of stagger all of the things that might be due for you guys. This was an attempt of mine to mitigate the effects of all of your professors assigning things to be due on the last day of class and or having projects due on the last day of class and having exams on the last day of class. All right, so I've moved it up. It's gonna be on 420, right? As a result, we'll have two class periods after exam number two. One of them, we will have a guest speaker. I will be serving the district on that day, so I will not be here. And so we'll have a guest speaker and there will be an extra credit writing opportunity on that day. Right? And on the last day, we will have course evaluations, also a chance for extra credit as well on those days. And so, um, so again, exam two is going to be on Thursday. This is the Thursday, I believe, we return from our Easter break right, uh, after that week. Uh, over the course of these last few weeks, rather than having a final project, Having a, a series of optional writing assignments, which is part of that extra credit project question. And so uh, there will be three assignments in particular for this. This is in lieu of a project number four. And so there, there will not be a project number four, but rather three optional writing assignments. What's that? There is no final exam during final week. We have an exam which is the last exam, exam number two. But uh, it's not a final exam, and it's not cumulative either. Nothing during the final exam. And lastly, we are covering pardon, two more right, chapters in Patterson and Hennessy, two important concepts right, that we are going to cover before exam number two related to cash hierarchies and memory management. And lastly, the, the idea of interrupted base or right, computing. All right, so we sort of glazed over this and discussed it at a high level when we discussed uh, synchronous versus asynchronous communication. And, uh, this is really important when you're dealing with uh, I.O. input output and going to and from the processor on and off chip. And, and so we'll discuss interrupt based uh, communication and the hardware and software necessary to facilitate such communication. And, uh, the homework for those two chapters will be posted soon. I believe you have a homework for Chapters one and two are chapters one and four, which had to do with the pipelining uh, due shortly. So this will be the one after that. That'll be the last homework. So this is sort of a schedule wrapping things up for our, for our course right now, moving forward. Uh, any questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Now, it won't be cumulative in, in any real sense. The, you know, in a sense, we've been sort of building concepts on top of each other, right? but uh, it won't be cumulative. It certainly won't be focusing on the things we covered in the first half. It'll largely just focus on everything since about our discussion of compilers. Right. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll move on with our discussion on making our computing machine more efficient. Mm -hmm. All right, so if you want to read uh, along, you can go ahead and start Patterson and Hennessy, Chapter 5. And this has to do with uh, memory, memory management, and memory hierarchies. And so today we're briefly going to talk about the technology and speeds associated with various memory and memory types. Then we'll look at schemes for making memory access more efficient. It's, uh, specifically today, we're going to focus on cache, what caching is, what a cache hierarchy is, and how we use our cache to, right, uh, to gain benefits with respect to improved latency right, for accessing memory. Where we are in the big picture of things is right about here, right, in the memory box. And uh, this is a part in our pipeline, right? We have the go to memory stage, which 
And depending on which example we run in class, we would say that it might take anywhere between you know, two, three, four, five clock cycles to go to memory to maybe 100 clock cycles. And so we'll see why it's so highly variable right? and how we can try to get it to a latency of two or three clock cycles rather than 100 or 1,000 or possibly even more. So the organization of our computer right, and specifically the memory component is very important right, as it is arguably our von Neumann's bottleneck here, right? The von Neumann's bottleneck is the bus which connects the data to the processor, right? Bringing data to and from our processor, right? As it going across this bottleneck, right? This bottleneck is a super highway, which can get a log jam from time to time, which will involve stalls and delays in our pipeline, which reduces our computing efficiency, right? So uh, in order to help alleviate these issues, since many programs are in fact accessing data, right, this is usually the, one of the main purposes of computing, we want to try to alleviate this issue and make access to memory fast. Right. The main way that we do this right, is to employ a memory hierarchy. Right? At different stages of the hierarchy, we have different memory sizes and different memory technologies. Right. Uh, the different memory sizes allow us to access data within the memories more quickly or less quickly. Right. Uh, and the different memory technologies also allow for speed. Right, and for speed. Right. When it comes to the different memory technologies, we also have different prices associated with different types of memories. Right. And so this also needs to be taken into account when trying to produce a, an efficient machine. Right. That also has a reasonable cost-benefit ratio. Right. So, you know, much of our story thus far has been a sob story when it comes to making our computer, our computer faster, right? Uh, all of the gains, all the ways we can improve our CPI, such as increasing the clock speed right, or increasing parallelism uh, and, you know, reducing the size of transistors, right? All of these were, in a sense, hitting a wall, right? Uh, we're, in a sense, maxing out a lot of the gains we can get, right, with respect to a lot of our technology. Similarly, we, we've reached a memory wall, but there are still some gains to be made with respect to memory usage and memory management. So we'll, we'll talk about that. And, uh, over the past few years, we've noted a huge number of gains when it comes to right, uh, computing in general. Right? We've been able to reduce the transistor sizes. Right? Uh, power consumption is, you know, we hit a wall with, with respect to power consumption as well and heat dissipation. Um, but again, since let's say 1980, we've made some pretty steady improvements. On Moore's Law, we were able to double the number of transistors, for example, improve computability, right, at essentially an exponential rate. Here, we're showing it with a logarithmic uh, Y scale. Although we've been gaining those, right, uh, gaining right, this performance, this is a reduced uh, clocks per instruction. And we have been gaining improvements with respect to our core pipeline Right, much faster than with improvements in memory access. Right, as a result, right, the the disparity between the improvement with our CPU and our memory, right, has not been increasing similarly. Right. Also, as a result here, right, uh, any latencies incurred from memory access is going to demolish or or smash any gains that we have. Not any gains, but relatively the gains we achieve from our improved CPU. Right or improved CPI based on you know, the core of our pipeline, the core of our CPU. So how can we improve this, right? Again, the, the latency and stalls are really the big thing that, that affects our efficiency, our CPI when it comes to the pipeline. Otherwise, the pipeline is a great machine. Right? Has good parallelism, right? We're able to get the CPI down with VLIW, Right, and other forms of parallelism, we can get CPI below one. That is, we can execute more than one instruction per cycle. Right? However, we have our delays. Right? We have our data hazards. Right? And these hazards and delays are almost all related to memory. Some of them can be alleviated, some of them cannot. But the ones that can be alleviated, right, we'll look at ways to do this. So with respect to performance metrics, right, our major concerns, of course, are latency going to and from memory, reading and writing to memory. Uh, bandwidth is also a concern, right? This is our bottleneck to the memory. It's our memory may have some number of limited ports and channels, buses running to and from, 
right? This will be a bottleneck even if our memory is somewhat fast. We might have to stall reads or writes based on, you know, simply our log jam right, on our on our bus. And we also have concerns related to overall access time, right? When you know, what sort of delay is there in propagating access down to a random access memory, right? Retrieving or decoding the address where the item, right, some data item that we're searching for exists, right? And then forwarding it along back to the CPU, right? Thus answering that request. So we'll look at some of these latency times and see how the idea of caching can, can help right, reduce this latency. And next we'll look at some of the technologies used. The most common technologies used, or at least the ones we'll focus on here, are DRAMs and SRAMs. And generally speaking, DRAM is used for and DRAM is used for main memory, and SRAM is used for cache. Right. There are pros and cons associated with both SRAM and DRAM. Um, and given these pros and cons, right, you'll see why the SRAM is generally used for cache and DRAM is generally used for main memory. So SRAM right, requires about six transistors per bit stored. So as far as density, it's not very dense. Right? Uh, however, this device is very fast. Right? We'll have another slide where we have a good comparison of SRAM and DRAM and the pro and con trade off of each. Right? Uh, but SRAM has the ability to maintain its data. It will retain the data forever as long as it has power. So it is volatile, but it can retain data without having to refresh. And this is not true for dynamic random access memory. Right? The dynamic, the DM dynamic means that we have to dynamic, that is constantly refresh right, our bits right, because the charges will dissipate over time. Right? This refresh occurs periodically and depending on the, the technology, maybe around every eight or maybe it's less nowadays, so milliseconds right, uh, for a refresh. Note that this refresh also uses up clock time and memory usage time. So while we are doing this refresh, we cannot access those areas of memory, thus causing more stalls right, and more delays in latency. DRAM has a number of pros, however. It is right, very dense. That is, we can each bit that we store is done with just simply one transistor. Right? Uh, and it is effectively you know, optimized for size rather than speed. Right, uh, RAM right, uh, consists, you know, RAM nowadays is on the order of gigabytes, right, and so they're, right, uh, rather than having or focusing on fast access, we're focusing on having a high addressability. Right, as we'll see, there's a general trade off with memory and, and address. You know, the bigger the memory, the higher the latency, the smaller the memory, the lower the latency. This simply has to do with decoding and addressing, you know, gigabytes of possible address locations. Right, so again, the big picture with this technology, our technology has not kept up with uh, the pace of our pipelines and processors when it comes to being efficient. Right, uh, so some ways we've optimized this, right, uh, many of you are probably familiar with some of these from the hardware class, right, with our dynamic RAM, right, we were able to add ports, add parallelism, so we can read write at the same time. Right, so we have more read ports, more write ports. We can write multiple words at the same time, read multiple words at the same time, et cetera. Right, we have the double data rate, the DDR. And this is pretty common. I've probably all of your laptops have a DDR RAM right now. This is just the, uh, you have a double the rates. That is, you can do a transfer on both a rising and a falling edge to the clock cycle. I think some of the newer laptops now have the, the quad, uh, quad rate as well, which allows for simultaneous read and write with the rise edge, so we get four times the, the efficiency, and, uh, thus a double improvement over DDR. Right, so uh, there are improvements still being made with respect to memory technology, so this is an area of our computing machine. Right? We haven't quite you know, hit the, the end of the wall, right? uh, so there are still some improvements to be made. Right, so given these basic technologies, right, how can we make them more efficient? Right? So the, the first answer to that question is to increase or to use a hierarchy system. Right? The main goals of our hierarchy system are to, number one, get our data closer to the CPU so it doesn't have to travel over this logram, over the bus, over the bottleneck. Right? Second, 
right? We come up to a T in our, or, uh, to a peak in our pyramid, right? By making the, the size of our memory smaller and smaller and smaller, the closer it, is, the closer it gets to the CPU, excuse me. Right, the reason for this is the smaller the memory, right, the faster the access. Right, so that's answer number one. Right, we're going to improve right, our memory latency with hierarchy. Next, we can also gain improvements with parallelism. Right? This has to do with widening our channels, widening the bus, adding ports to our, to our memory components, allowing for reading and writing simultaneously. In the grand scale of things, here's a, a typical memory hierarchy, similar to one, again, on your devices, very likely. Right? At this one end here, we have our, our data path, right, off to the pipeline, off to the CPU. Right? We have some controlling device. The most, you know, at the very, very top of this hierarchy, you can think of the register files, just basic flip-flops, right, in our pipeline on the chip, right, storing temporary data as it's being loaded to and from memory to perform operations or to help with operations being performed by the ALU stage of our pipeline. Right after this, we have the next level of cache. This is going to be the first level of cache. This is generally on chip and uh, referred to as L1 cache. Right after that, your computer may have some other levels of cache. Sometimes there's an L2, sometimes an L3 cache. Right. After our cache, we have the main memory. Right. This is generally where we switch from the SRAM technology to the DRAM technology, right? As main memory is generally larger, you want to be able to load large chunks of data, pages of data from, right, our base of memory, which is secondary storage. Right? This is, at least in the olden days, this was, uh, these were rotary disks, right? Nowadays, they have the solid state for uh, secondary memory as well. And some of the reasons why each of these, right, uh, each of these levels in our hierarchy are where they are has to do with their speed, right, which is related to their size and their proximity right, to, the, to the CPU right, right, and their size. Right. SRAM right, is much more expensive than our, right, uh, than our DRAM, at least, at least currently. These, the costs are, are changing, of course, as the technology and uh, implementation techniques improve. Uh, but if you want to look at each of these with respect to their, their delay, their speed, and their price to get an idea of, of uh, cost-benefit ratios, right, here's the speed and their size. So register files, right, you can generally access register files, read or write to them in less than a clock cycle. Right? In many of our pipelines, we discuss that we can do a read and a write on a rising and a falling edge. And so we can access that memory very quickly. Right? It's right there on chip, very likely within the pipeline. Right, uh, and, and so this is going to be the, fit, the quickest access. Right, next we have our L1 cache. Right, accessing L1 cache is usually on the order of one clock cycle, right, that depending on the, the, the clock speed and the technology being used, it could be a delay of two, three, maybe four cycles to access that memory and retrieve from that memory. Right. Note here that it is common to have a cache for the instruction and for the data, right? We'll discuss the reasons of that right, shortly. Right? That is, when you go to load the instructions and data, you have an instruction path and a data path, right? The instructions are gonna go to the IF stages, right? Whereas the data is gonna be shunted into the, the register files, right? And inputs to the ALU. So instructions and data will both be cached, right? And this is our L1 cache. Again, we have a pretty low latency there. Right, the sizes are also indicated down here. The size for register file, right, uh, in, in terms of bytes, you know, how many registers does our ISA have? Right, we might have like, hundreds, on the order of hundreds of bytes then allocated, depending on whether we have 64 registers or, or 128 or more. Right, uh, L1 cache might be on the order of tens of thousands of bytes. Right, if, if your computer does have uh, an L2 cache, that might be on the order of millions, right, uh, or, uh, megabytes, excuse me. Then we might have on the order of gigabytes for main memory nowadays. Right? And 
secondary story. All right. All right. So again, what's the general idea here? If we're going to access memory, right, we don't want to go all the way to our secondary storage. Why? Because we're going to incur extraordinary latency. And right? so rather than every single time we make a request going to our secondary storage, let's pull some of that data up into main memory. Right? Then we just reapply that same intuition. Right? Rather than always going to main memory, right, let's pull that data up closer to our CPU. Right, on a smaller swath of memory, which is going to have right, slower latency times because it's smaller. Right? And since it's smaller, we can use better technology and get a good cost benefit ratio. Right? And so we can use SRAM for these smaller caches, which will give us speed, right? both attained by technology, better technology, and speed because it is smaller addressability. We don't have to decode address spaces of gigabytes and gigabytes or terabytes. All right, so right, as we saw from that previous slide, the SRAM right, speed right, is, is built for speed. Uh, typical access times on the order of maybe 0.5 to 2.5 nanoseconds. So depending on the speed of your clock, right, you might have a latency of just one, maybe two or three or, or so right, for memory access. So really fast, especially when compared to going all the way down to main memory, where you might get latency of 100 cycles or more. Right. The cons, of course, are that there it's low density. That is, right, to build to store one bit, you're going to need six transistors. Right, uh, relatively speaking, this is going to be higher power, so you have power dissipation issues, especially since this is so close to the CPU. Right, and it's pricey. Right? Uh, that is, per gigabyte. This was a few years ago. This has gone down significantly, uh, but per gigabyte, we're talking on the order of thousands of dollars. Right, this is uh, an SRAM, so it's static. The content will last forever, right, as long as the power is left on. It is volatile memory, right, so it does need constant power. Right, DRAM, for comparison, again, looking at some more of the, the specs here, right, the typical access time is it's going to be a little bit higher. Right, this is due to, number one, DRAM is usually built for size. Right, because it's in the, the stage just above our secondary storage, we want it to be a little bit larger so we can load a lot of stuff in secondary storage so we never have to go there. Right, at least while our computer is running, right, while it's processing. Um, however, this means that access time is going to be reduced. Right? Uh, it's also going to be reduced because of the technology. It's going to have to be dynamically refreshed right, multiple times per second. Right? The pros for DRAM are that right, it is dense. Right? Relatively speaking, the, the power is, is going to be lower. Right? However, you do need to actively refresh. And, and it is much cheaper. Uh, price, uh, the price point, and so um, again, these prices have, have changed. They've they've both gone down since 08, right? Uh, but it is still notably cheaper than SRAM. All right. So intuitively speaking, it seems to make sense. You know, I've said a lot of words like faster and closer to the CPU. You guys are like, yeah, sure. That sounds like you know, that's a good thing, right? Um, but conceptually speaking. Uh, this memory hierarchy works due to two principles related to locality. Right? And hierarchies take advantage of temporal locality and spatial locality. Right? And so these are two things that are not necessarily true, but things that generally tend to be true in the field of computation. Right? Temporal locality is going to rely on the hope right, that if a memory location is referenced at some point, then it's going to be referenced again very soon. And so we're going to take the time to propagate it up that hierarchy to the stage of memory, right, or the, the uh, L1 cache right, on our pyramid, the hierarchy level of memory, right, where it can be accessed the most quick right, for subsequent access. Again, depending on what program you're running, this may or may not be true, but it's very often true, very common, uh, very commonly true. You can think of a, any program that you've written where you might access a flag variable, right, in a conditional statement or something like this multiple times, right, 
So if it's in, in a loop, such as an iterator, right, you're gonna access that place in memory multiple times. And if you haven't loaded it to a register, right, you're gonna have to right, uh, propagate it or you'll propagate it up at least to the L1 stage, if not the register stage, right? So you can access it very quickly without any right, delays. If you had to go all the way to your secondary disk, for example, to access you know, the value of an iterator, and it would take a long time to complete any loop. The second, the second principle of locality we take advantage of is spatial locality. Right? So not just local in time, but also in space. Right? A good example here is simply an array. Right? So if you're going to access one element in the array, right, rather than just grabbing that one element and propagating it up the hierarchy, grab a whole chunk of that array and propagate it up. The idea here is that since you're accessing one piece of memory in that area of memory, maybe you're going to access some of the neighboring pieces in memory soon as well. And so propagate right, uh, areas in memory that are contiguous or near to each other, right? thus taking advantage of the idea of spatial locality. Right, some basic terminology before we dive into a few examples and see how cache generally works. And it's a block is simply, or sometimes referred to as a line, and it is simply the minimum unit or chunk of information right, that is loaded into or loaded off of a cache. When accessing memory, since we're using this hierarchical scheme, what, what we'll generally do is access the top of the hierarchy first. So we'll look in the L1 cache right, to see if the data we're looking for has already been propagated. Right? If we find it there, right, we call this a hit. If we don't find it there, we call it a miss. So this is a, a cache hit and a cache miss. Right? The hit rate is simply the fraction of time where you find the data you're looking for right, in the cache. Right? We'll say the top level of the cache. The time associated with that is the access time for that particular level of cache. Right? Given that you have SRAM technology and given the speed of your, of your clock, this might just be one clock cycle. Right? It might be three or four. Right? Again, that's your best case scenario, cache hit, right? Sadly, you can also have a cache miss, right? So if you are looking for some piece of data and it's not in that top level of cache, you've missed. Right? Um, and so what's the down of this? Well, you can incur right, a miss penalty. And if you don't find what you're looking for, you can't just throw your hands up and say, you know, sorry, computer, data's not there, right? You know that it exists somewhere, so you have to go down the hierarchy looking for it. And so the time it takes to go down the hierarchy, find what you're looking for, and then bring back the data you are searching for or request or that was requested, right, is called your miss penalty. And generally speaking, when you have a cache miss and you're using a caching scheme, you're going to find the data you're looking for, and then you're going to bring it back up, propagate it back up the cache. So there is a, a latency, right, an extra penalty incurred for simply searching for this data, right? finding it, you know, the, finding which level in the hierarchy it is that is closest to CPU, right? Then propagating that data up to the highest level again in hopes of temporal locality that you're going to access that data again shortly. As you might expect, and given our numbers before, right, the hit time is much less than the miss time or the time associated with miss the miss penalty. And the reason for this is simply, as we go down our hierarchy, the latency significantly increases due to the size and technology being used by those levels in memory. And so here's the general scheme of our pyramid here along with the sizes right, of data that are, that are generally propagated. And so since we're going from large memory modules to smaller memory modules or components, right, we're going to propagate chunks at different levels. So the chunk, when we're talking about propagating memory from secondary storage to our main memory, right, is going to be very different size than a data chunk when we're propagating, let's say, from L2 to the L1 caches. Right. So generally speaking, it's a disk chunk or a chunk of data from disk, which is generally called a page, and a page in memory, right? Maybe on the order of kilobytes. And so whenever we load or grab data from secondary memory, and propagate it up to main memory, we'll do so by pages. 
generally will then propagate up memory from, uh, or data from main memory up to L2 on the order of blocks. And depending on your ISA, right, your, or the addressability of the, of, of the ISA you're using, right, these blocks may have variable sizes. Right, but on the order of a handful of blocks are generally propagated up from main memory to L2. Right, and then L2 to L1 is generally done in block by block. Right, though we'll look at cases where, that, where we might uh, load multiple blocks. But generally speaking, uh, one block at a time from L2 to L1. Right, and then from L1 to our registers, we simply load right, one word and then data value. Right, note here, of course, that this hierarchy not only has to do with size, right, it has to do with distance from the processor. There's a huge difference here between L2 and memory, main memory because of our bus. Right? And there's a big difference between main memory and secondary memory and uh, due to technology as well, especially if you have rotating disks. Right, so there's a lot of overhead involved with this as you might expect. Right? All of this improved performance comes at a cost, just as it did with our pipeline. Right? So we're going to need a number of extra controllers uh, and some overhead signals, some overhead signals to, to help manage our caching system. Right? For our talks right, today and on Thursday, we're going to focus with our cache controller and how we can manage our cache system using a cache controller. We will discuss the cache controller and virtual memory on Thursday. Today, we're going to focus just on the basics. Whoa, sorry about that. All right. So, some cache basics. So, two big questions uh, that we're going to pose to ourselves, and then we're going to answer them and see how the cache actually works, how it's actually used. And so, number one, how do we know whether a data item is in the cache or not? So we'll have to have some sort of control signal, control bits to identify, right, or bits to identify whether data is in our cache block, which data is in our cache block, and is that data valid? And then secondly, we'll need a, a way to retrieve data if it's not in our cache block. Right? We'll need a way to determine whether it's in the block Right? And if not, we need to be able to find it. And then we'll need some sort of scheme for propagating it back up. In our following example, we'll look at direct mapped cache. This is a common and simple way to right, map memory addresses to corresponding cache blocks. Right? In a direct map system, each memory block is mapped to just one cache. Uh, or each memory chunk or location is ma mapped to just one cache block. Right? Uh, this means that there will be many places in memory or locations in memory that will map to the same block. And this is inevitable because in main memory, we're going to have maybe gigabytes, whereas in our L1 cache, right, we might just have a kilobyte. Right? So if we want to be able to potentially load any, any piece of data from any place in memory up to our L1 cache, it's going to be a mini to one mapping. This will cause some issues, but again, the, the pros almost always outweigh the cons in this scenario. How do we perform this mapping? Well, the mapping is generally done somewhat similar, similarly to a trivial hash, since we're dealing with binary addresses here. All we need to do is take the modulo of some number of those bits of right, so the number of bits we have, right, mod right, uh, the hash size. Right, based on this, the remaining bits will be unique identifiers for each block of memory or each chunk of memory that is actually loaded into the cache. And this is referred to as the tag. And right, this tells us exactly which memory location is actually in the cache at the moment. Right, so that was a lot of words. Right, I think examples are, are worth more than words in many instances. So when we come back from our break, we'll go through a quick example right, and see how we load data from this memory here into this cache here. And just a simple example to see how right, the mapping, right, our trivial hash, our direct map works, and how we can verify right, whether uh, the data is valid and identify which data is actually loaded currently. Okay. Uh, two minute break.
I encourage you to step out into the hallway because it's much easier. <laughs> How's it guys, we'll go ahead and uh, continue with our example here with the cache. And so again, the, the idea of having a caching system is a hierarchical system where we propagate data from lower levels of our memory hierarchy up to higher levels for the purposes of speed, speed, and speed. Right? And so here's an example of main memory, right, where we only have 15 chunks of memory right, with these addresses starting at 0 and 15. And here we only have a cache size. Right, uh, four, right, we're looking for the data here. Right, each block of data, we right, can get into our data segment here. Right, our valid bit is a bit, so a control bit that's used to determine whether the data is valid currently in the cache or not. Intuitively, this is initially set to zero as our cache upon onset of when we turn on the computer, for example. Right, to be, there's nothing loaded necessarily into that cache, so everything is invalid at the moment, so that valid bit is turned off. Right. Using more complex caching schemes, we'll discuss a few of them as well, uh, as probably on Thursday. Right. So you may need to use the valid bit for, for other purposes. Uh, we'll talk about that in cache coherence on Thursday. And, uh, but for now, it's just, you can just think of it as you know, the data is valid or not at some point. And our tag is a unique identifier for each location in memory, given we know which block in the cache it is in. 
So how do we do this? Right. Well, we have a mini, it's one mapping here. Right. So these black digits right, in our memory right, are related to which block we're going to store that location in memory right, in the cache. Right. So since this digit ends in zero, zero, right, and this one down here ends in zero, zero, this one down here ends in zero, zero, and so on and so forth, zero, zero. Right. They all get mapped to this cache block. This is the one for index zero, zero. Similarly, all of the addresses ending in 01 will get mapped to this block, this one, and this one. And again, this, these potential collisions are inevitable given the fact that we're mapping from a larger, larger memory component to a smaller memory component. All right, so the, is that orange or red? Peach? The peach color, right, is the remainder of our address space. Right, this is used to uniquely identify what data is actually loaded in here. So for example, if you wanted to look for the data stored at memory location, let's say eight, right, you would know that it would be mapped here, right, because it would be one zero zero zero. So it would be mapped to this cache block here. Right, but how do you know this is eight as opposed to zero right, or as opposed to four, etc.? cetera? Right, the tag tells us the leading bits right, in the memory address. Right, so it can allow us to uniquely identify what the data is loaded in that cache block. And so this is used for verification purposes to see whether we have a cache hit or whether we've had a cache miss. So the cache hit being the data we were looking for was in the block right, where it should be, or the data is not in the block where it should be. That's right, so what I've just said there. Again, so these are the values. Right, that are stored in our tag. And so let's go ahead and check an example here. So this is very simple. We just have one word per block in our cache. We have a simple direct mapping. The direct map is simply the first few bits right, going from the least significant side. So the last few, if you think of it from the least, are being used to index into our cache. All right. So let's consider the following memory accesses. So let's say we want to access memory location 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 4, 15. Note that our cache is initially empty, and so we're going to incur a lot of misses at the onset. And this is very common, of course, as your cache will be empty and once your computer starts. All right. So note that all of these blocks are going to be initially marked invalid as well. All right. So let's say we want to access the 0 first. What happens? So we get a miss. Right, we check the zero location here because zero is right zero 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 zero. So it's going to map to the zero block in our cache because the last two bits are zero. There's no data there. It is it is invalid. Right, it is marked as in, invalid. So right, uh, we have a miss. And so we will need to retrieve the data from a lower level of cache and propagate it up. And so after that penalty, we will eventually load our cache, and it will look like this. So now we have memory location at zero stored in the zero block, and our tag is zero, zero, because these are the two first bits, or the highest significant bits. Right? This universally identifies that this is, in fact, memory zero rather than memory eight or memory four. Right, so now let's say that we request to access one. Again, here we're going to get a miss because one would belong to this location in memory because its last two bits are zero, 01, so it goes to the max to the zero, 01 block. And after our miss penalty, after we go searching for this item and then propagate it back up our cache, uh, up to the top level of cache, we find it will load it. Note again here that the tag is zero because the binary representation of one is zero, zero, this is our tag, and then zero, 01, which is the index into the first block of our cache. And similarly, when we access three and four, we're going to get misses. We're going to load up two here, then we're going to load up three here. Note, of course, that the tags for all these are zeros because all zero, one, two, and three all start with two zeros given our eight bit addressing system. Excuse me, four bit addressing system. Right, any questions about that? Once you understand this example, right, the, the basics are, are pretty easy. Everything follows from this, right? 
if you have questions, then now's a great time to ask all the examples up. Right, at this point, if we access four, note that there is something right in the four, right? So four is zero, one, and then zero, zero, right? So this should get mapped to the zero portion of our cache. There is something there. So the zero block in our cache is occupied, but it's occupied by zero, not four. So this is a cache miss because the data we're looking for is not there. Something's there, but it's not the data we're looking for. So this is a miss, which means what? We need to propagate up the data we're looking for. And this means overwriting the data from memory location zero. So this data is clobbered and the four, whatever was stored in memory location four is written there. Note that our tag is zero one, indicating that this is in fact memory location number four. If we were to access memory location number three at this point, right, we would check in the cache. Right? Since the last two bits in three are one one, right, we would check our last location in the memory cache, in our cache, at the last block, excuse me, in our cache. Right? We would in fact see that the data for memory three is there. We can verify it because the tag is zero zero, indicating zero zero one one, the address of three. Right? So we can verify that this is indeed a cache hit and we can just simply directly pull the data from here, directly retrieve it, no miss penalty incurred. Right, so this is our, our benefit. We had a lot of misses to load our cache initially, right? but if, then if our subsequent accesses have, uh, are with data that are already in our cache, right? we, we uh, reap the benefits of our caching system. Note here, if we request a four, right? we find the four, and so we have another hit. Right? And then lastly, if we request a 15, right, we're gonna get a miss, Again, there's a data item there, data item number three, memory location three is stored right there. But we would get a miss because the tag does not match. Right? The tag for 15 would be a one one. However, this tag is a zero zero indicating memory location three, not memory location number 15. And so we get a miss and then we would propagate up 15, this location and change the tag to one one indicating that this was the data being stored here is 1111, our memory location. Okay. Nice. Note here we had a total of eight requests and six misses. And not exactly the, our best case scenario here, right? Considering that each miss penalty is going to be quite significant. But again, at the onset of computing when our cache is empty, this is, this is bound to happen. happen. All right, great. All right, so how do we get this done? Whoa. Sorry about that again. So how do we get this done? Uh, well, looking at each of our words here. Hmm. Not gonna move anything here. And so looking at each of our words here, we have our 32 bits and we have a byte offset. Right, if we have uh, 32 bits in each byte, we're going to have four, so we have two bits for our byte offset. And then we have our 32 bits for each of our words. So let's say that we have right, uh, hash in this particular instance, right, where we have 10 bits uh, used for our index. That means we're going to have 2 to the 10 number of cash blocks. And in order to index that many blocks, we're going to have to use the first 10 bits. So bits number uh, zero to nine right, in our uh, in our address system. Right, and so those signals right, allow us to properly index right, into our cache. And in our previous example, right, we just had the, the four address bits. Here we have 32 address bits. And this is a more realistic mix example. So if we had a cache size. Right, where we had 1024 blocks, right? We would use the least significant bits, the 10 most least significant bits, to index into those cache blocks. Right, that means the remaining bits would need to be used as tags to help uniquely identify which memory location is actually loaded currently into the cache. And so right, this is allowed for verification purposes. By right, using the tag, Right, and our index signals, and whether the data is valid or not, we can determine whether we have a hit. And this information will be sent over to our, our cache controller. 
right? And then data will be retrieved or not accordingly. So note here for each cache block, we need to store enough bits, right? We have to have bits for the data. We're gonna need bits for the tag, and we're gonna need one bit for validity and the validity bit. Right, assuming that we have uh, 32 bits to store each data value, each word, and given our setup here and given our cache size, we're gonna need 20 bits for a tag. So for each cache block, we're gonna need 53 bits. And so each one of the rows here, we're gonna need 53 bits for each row. And if we have 1024 of them, that's 1024 times 53, that's the size of our whole cache. Note just the data portion of the cache is 1024 times 32 bits. All right, that's the single word block you know, sketch or diagram for a cache. What type of locality are we taking, of, taking advantage of here? And so think about this question. And think about our temporal locality and our spatial locality. Which type of locality are we taking advantage of in this particular scenario? We access, what's that? Temporal. Yeah, temporal. And why? Because we access data, we propagate it up here, and we store the one data item in our cache, right? and we're doing so hopes and hopes that we're going to use it again. Why not spatial? Well, we're just loading up one word here. Right? We haven't loaded a chunk of data surrounding that word in anticipation of accessing data around that one word we currently access. And so if we wanted to also take advantage of spatial locality, right, we would allow for multiple chunks right, per access. Right? So each cache block could consist of multiple words, right, and thus we can load consecutive words per block. And so here we would load multiple data items right, into each cache block, Right. Again, we would have a similar indexing scheme. If our cache size, the total size of our cache, we wanted to remain the same, we would have to reduce the total number of blocks, but each block can store four words. Rather than one block per word, we're going to have four words per block. Right. In order to do this, the, the number of bits used for indexing right, are going to slightly change. Note here we can use the lower two bits to simply determine our block offset, right? Since there's four different blocks or four different words in each block, right? We'll need to use two bits to make that determination, which word in the block we're trying to access, right? Then the remaining eight bits can be used to index into the cache, right? And we still have our 20 bits for the tag. This helps us to take advantage, not just of temporal locality, but also spatial locality. Temporal, because we're still loading up data we're accessing to the top end, the high end of our hierarchy. Spatial as well, and because we are loading not only that one value we're currently accessing, but we're loading a couple of other data values here. Right. So let's step through an example and see what sort of benefits we reap where we've changed not really the size of our cache, right? The size of our cache, the overall size hasn't changed. We've sort of just changed the structure here. Right? We're still only allowing four words here but we have two blocks and then two words per block rather than four blocks and one word per block. So just storing four data items, just changing how we're organized here. So let's say again that we go through our scenario, load memory, location zero, one, two, three, to 15. And again with our zero, when we start off, we get a miss. Note here when we load the memory location at zero, we also load the memory location near to it. Given our scheme here, zero is going to go into the rightmost bucket, and then one is going to go into the next one. This is our bucket zero. We're using the first bit, zero and one, to identify which of the words we're trying to access. The remaining two bits, or excuse me, the, uh, the other two bits, the middle two bits, are being used to, uh, I'm sorry, the least significant bit is being used to distinguish between the words in each block. The next bit is being used to determine which block, right? And the two leading bits, the two most 
significant bits are being used as the tag. All right, so we've loaded up our first block. Right, since memory zero is in this first block, we simply load the entire block. Note at this point, when we go to access the item in memory location one, right, you get a hit right away. Again, taking advantage of spatial locality. Right, when we go to access memory location number two, right, the least significant bits are one and zero. Right, so it should be in the lock number one, word number zero. So it should be here. Right, however, it's not. Right, it's invalid, it hasn't been loaded yet. Right, so we get a miss and then we load that item. Note we also load everything else that should be in that block so we load memory location three. This means that our subsequent access to memory location three is going to be a hit. Again, taking advantage of spatial locality. Right here, we're loading memory address number four. Memory address number four, right, we have zero one and one zero. I'm sorry, zero one, zero zero. And so it's going to get mapped to the zero block of our cache. We have an item there. How do we know that this item is not memory location number four? Right. The tag is incorrect. The tag is zero, zero, indicating that we have memory location zero and one. Right. So we have a miss. So this tells us we need to reload this value. So we reload memory location four and memory location five into this block, right, and reset the tag. Right, note here, right, when we access three, we still have our hit. Right. Note here, when we load four, we get a hit. Right, I'm going to back up a few items here, though. Note that there's also a pro con, it's a double edged knife when we have our block loading. In many instances, we're going to get benefits as we did in this example. Right. Well, let's say that after we load this four, Right, we wanted to then load memory location one. At that point, we had overwritten memory location one with memory location five in the hopes of spatial locality. Uh, we would have incurred a miss there. Generally speaking in computation, as long as you're traversing your data effectively, right, this is less likely, this scenario is less likely, and so spatial locality should hold. So this is generally considered a, a good scheme having some number of blocks. However, you can get block happy, right? where you have too many words in a block. Right? Uh, and so uh, we have a trade-off between spatial and temporal locality. If you don't want to go into one extreme or the other, that is, you don't necessarily want to have uh, a cache of a fixed size with just one word per block. And you don't want to go to the other extreme where you just have a cache with one block and a whole bunch of words. Instead, there's a sweet spot in the middle where you have a good number of cache blocks and a good number of words per block. Right, thus giving you a good trade-off between time and space. All right. So in this particular scenario, our eight requests only resulted in four misses, so we had a, a marked improvement from our previous example. Right, so how do we how would you illustrate this sweet spot? I mean, here's an example if we were to have a gross mapping right, of block size versus miss rate. Right, each one of these plots right, is assuming different size cache, right? And as our block size increases, we're not changing the size of the overall cache, it stays fixed. So as our block size uh, increases, the number of blocks is gonna decrease. Right. So again, if we err all the way on the size here where we have a small block size, that is each block is just one word, right? We're, we're not gonna have the best performance right, because we're not taking advantage of spatial locality. We're just loading up one word every time we have a hit or miss. Again, at the other extreme, if we wanted the block size to be as big as possible, it could be very extreme, meaning we would just have one block, but that block would hold maybe 10k words. Right? That would be another extreme where we're taking advantage of spatial locality, but not temporal locality at all. And so again, if you want a nice balance between spatial and temporal locality, right, you would choose a reasonable balance between the two. Again, this assumes that we have a fixed cache size, but you're just changing the structure, as we did in our previous example. 
right? Quantifying the structure, right? We already did an example of this, but here's another example. I crammed a lot onto this slide, I apologize. There's, there are a lot of numbers to add, so I thought I'd just put them all there so you can read over them. Um, there will also be a number of homework questions which will help, help you to try to understand the structure and quantification of caches, sizes, how the tags, index, uh, and block offsets are related and how you can determine the size of the cache needed to store some amount of data. Now, generally speaking, if we have some, some address here, and some portion of it's going to be used for tag purposes for the cache, some of it's going to be used for indexing into the cache blocks, and some portion of it's going to be used for a block offset that is indexing the word for each block, right? and then we might have some byte offset. And in those computing systems, we address uh, bytes individually, even though uh, data types consist of multiple bytes. All right, so for a direct map cache, if we have two BDN blocks, then we're going to need to use in bits right, for the index. Right, if our block size consists of two BDN words, then we're going to have to use right, two BDN or, or in bits, I should say, uh, for addressing into the block. Right, so the remainder will be used for our tag label. Right, this tag, again, is our unique identifier in the cache. Right, so this is simply the remaining number of bits. Just 32, if we have a 32-bit uh, words, and we have 32 minus n plus m plus 2. All right, so this would mean that the total number of bits that we would need right, in a cache of this, right, of this nature would be 2bn right, times the block size. And we have 2bn blocks. Right, so each block is going to need what? It's going to have to store the data. Right? It's going to have to store that tag field. Right. And it's going to have to store whether the data is valid or not. So we'll have an extra bit per block for that. And so we're going to have two the n times, right, the block size, the data, the tag, and whether the data is valid or not. Right. So using this information, again, structurally, this makes sense. Right. We saw a few examples of caches. And so how many bits, right, how big would our cache need to be if we wanted to store 16 kilobytes of data? Right, assume that we have four word blocks, right, and we have 32 bit addresses. Right, well, given this information, right, we have right, 32 k bytes. Let's say we have 4 k. Right, this is two to the 12 words. And let's say that we have four words per block, right, as we noted here. Right, and there are 1024 blocks. And given this information, right, each block. Is going to have four words. Each word is 32 bits, so we're going to have four times 32 bits, right? or 128 bits. And that's just for the data for each right, for each block. Right. The tag right, is the number of bits needed to uniquely identify that chunk of data right, in our cache block. Right? That's going to be the total 32 bits right, minus the 10 for our index, and two for the block offset, and two for the byte offset. Then we're also going to have to add our valid bit. Right? Each block has a valid bit associated with it, so we're going to need one per block. Right? So for each data block, right? we have two to the 10 of them. Right? We're going to need to store one data chunk, which is right, one byte, right? which is 4 times 32, right? plus 18, which is the size of the tag necessary to uniquely identify each item in our cache, plus one, the validity bit needed for each data block. And so that ends up being 147 kilobytes. Right. Again, you'll have some homework questions to practice that. You know that it's almost working. All right. Uh, as we intimated before in our diagram, there it's common to use a cache for both instructions and data. And that is, if you go to load a program, you're going to grab and the instructions and load it into a cache. Right? If you go to access data, you're going to grab that data and load it into a cache. Let's look at what is entailed with a hit and a miss with respect to latency right, and overhead. If we have a read hit, whether it's for instruction or data, right, that's great. There's not really a lot that we incur in that scenario. This is our Best case scenario, right? This is what we want. 
right? We're looking for an instruction, we're looking for data, we find it right away. Okay. Let's say that we have a hit on our data, right? Uh, with respect to right. So let's say we have a right hit. And so you can read from the cache, right? You can also write to the cache. Right? If we write, right, you don't write to the instruction cache, but you might be writing to the data cache. That right? is, you want to store some value back to memory. So you would write it to the cache, and then that data would then need to eventually get written back to main memory, and then eventually back to the non-volatile storage. Right, so what is entailed with that? Right? Again, if we have a hit, this is a good scenario. However, there's a bit of overhead here since we wrote back to the high level of cache. We didn't write back to main memory necessarily at this point. So we need to come up with a scheme to make sure that this data gets down to memory or the non-volatile storage so that it is in fact actually saved. Right, in order for this, we need to impose some sort of scheme. We can, there are two general categories. You can have a cache memory consistent scheme or cache memory non-consistent scheme. Right, that is, you can allow the cache and the memory right, to be inconsistent with each other, right, or you can disallow that. Case. If you want to require that the cache and memory are consistent, and as soon as you do a write to the top level of cache, you need to continue that write through and propagate that write down the hierarchy. It just says if you were to do a read miss and you want to propagate data up the hierarchy, if you do a write hit, you need to propagate that hit down the hierarchy to the lower levels of memory. And this is generally, or the scheme generally used for this is called write through. It's simply just to write the data back right, to the cache block and then schedule writing down to the next level of memory. I say you schedule the writing down to the next, next levels of memory because writing right, to each level of memory becomes progressively slower right, as you go down the memory hierarchy. So there are going to be inherent delays to these writes. So as you're going to be able to do the write to the top level, you need to begin the write to the next level. However, you might have another write coming down from the top level, um, which will be held up. So you're going to have inherent propagation delays. So it's common to implement something like a write buffer to keep track of this and to sort of queue up all of the write to be done at each level of the hierarchy. The other scheme is simply to allow the cache and the memory to be inconsistent. Right? So it simply means that you just write the data back to the top level of cache, right? and don't worry about writing it back down to memory. Right? As long as that lock is loaded in the top level of cache, all subsequent accesses should just go to that top level of cache, so you shouldn't get any data invalidity, invalidity uh, excuse me, accesses. Right? However, if that lock gets evicted, that is, if you have a miss on that block and then you go to load data to overwrite that data in the cache currently, right, you'll need to write that data back to memory first. And so this is a write back scheme. And in this particular scheme, right, you will need to write back a block from a higher in the hierarchy down to a lower level right, whenever that block is evicted. And so the pro con trade off here is if you're going to be accessing that data at the, at the top level of the hierarchy quite a bit, and taking the time to write it down is probably going to cause unnecessary delays. And so if you're going to be accessing that chunk of data a lot right, in a short period of time, right, it's best not to take the time to write it through to memory. However, if you're going to be interacting with that piece of data right, uh, just once, right, then Taking, uh, then you might as well write it back then, right? Rather than incurring right, uh, that extra write back, which you'll have to incur in the end. Okay. So we'll deal. We'll talk about cache misses, and then we'll wrap things up for the day. And so that was what it what is entailed with a cache hit, right? And cache misses. We generally have three varieties. We've seen the first one here, the compulsory. A compulsory cache miss, which is simply due to the fact that the cache is empty when we start, when we start, uh, when we turn the computer on. And right, so the first access to the block is cold. Right, this is again, it's uh, not really practical to avoid this. Right, we will simply need to incur the penalty associated with this miss. Again, as we noted in our previous example, if we were to increase the block size, 
right? We can reduce the number of compulsory compulsory misses. Right? Uh, in our previous example, we when we had a cache miss on memory location zero, we also loaded memory location one at the same time, thus avoiding the miss on memory location one. And so again, uh, spatial locality increase the block size should reduce the number of compulsory misses, though not in all scenarios. All right, so next we have capacity misses and conflict misses. Capacity misses are simply due to the fact that the size of the cache is restricted, right, much less than the size of the lower levels of memory in the hierarchy. And so we can't possibly store all of the data in this cache that we're going to be using in, in most practical instances, especially if you're doing some major data analysis. So we are going to be limited by capacity, thus we are going to get a misses as a result. The cache is simply not large enough to hold all the data we're using. Right, the second type of data is conflict, and this is due to its collision. It's not completely unrelated to capacity, though uh, it, is, it is quite different than capacity. And a conflict that occurs simply when we're accessing data. It's, uh, let's say in, in a very extreme scenario, a program simply wants to access two pieces of data, right, sequentially, right, toggling between the two. Sadly, let's say for, you know, just by random chance, these two pieces of data just happen to map to, map to the same cache block. So every single time we access one, right, we're getting a miss and we load it up. And then, and then the next time we go to access memory, we're trying to access that other, we get a miss and load it up. And in this extreme case, and if we're not using the whole rest of the cache, right, we probably have a number of vacants and locations or blocks in our cache that aren't being used. And it just happens by chance that the two pieces of data that we're accessing are being mapped to the same cache block. And so this is clearly not simply related to capacity of the cache, but rather to the mapping scheme used to map the data items to the cache. And so this is a miss due to conflict. This uh, concept is not unsimilar to the idea of thrashing. Right? This, is a, this is a worst case scenario for, for many types of uh, for, for computing devices. And it's where you're getting a you're getting a significantly reduced performance because of a scheme we've implemented to improve performance because of this this caching scheme. Uh, there are ways to get around this using set associative uh, caches uh, rather uh, rather than direct caching. So we'll go ahead and stop now. When we get back, we'll wrap things up with respect to these slides. And uh, hopefully, plan in a discussion of virtual memory as well.